and they didn't inform the customer about the risks. Because there's that wind farm and there are companies' subsidies and there are government subsidies and they, it's a green investment. So they all felt, well, this is a great investment. But in essence, what they knew is it's a very new startup company. It was highly leveraged. It was a very high risk profile. The return was by no means adequate to the risk profile. In the meantime, this company went bankrupt. The bondholders are sitting in the hole. The bank who had financed first the wind parks got most of the money back because the bondholders were second tier, so the bank got their money back. And the bank even pushed the company finally into bankruptcy because by this they got more money out of what they have loaned to them to the wind parks than if they would have done a work through and potentially ended up with a smaller portion. So here is the self-interest of the financial system. Transaction-based, provisions, self-interest. And this system is absolutely broken. If you think about an industry where you would say, what industry most needs the most trust? It should be the financial industry, the banking industry, because that's where you lend your money, where you get your money back, and so on. A recent research did the financial industry is the industry with the most less trust between all industries. And I have to say, we as investors haven't been stepped up. We are playing the role. If I go to boardrooms and ask, have you checked about what is the compensation system in your asset management company? What is the turnover? Is there a kickback for high turnover and provisions? What is the annual kind of, uh, what is your focus on performance? Is it short term versus long term? You are investing the funds for your pensioners for 20, 30 years. Why are you concerned about your quarterly performance? And why are you forcing quarterly performance? And the boardrooms, they don't give me the answers because they haven't addressed it yet. So this, for me, is a major challenge going forward. And the last challenge I want to go through is, again, it was easy for the investors if it has financial impact, short-term financial impact. I think it's more critical if it has long-term impact. And here the themes like climate change, poverty, and so on, even if companies are involved there in CSR programs and so on, some of it you can't measure in your quarterly returns. So you have to have the confidence that you want to do it, that you feel in the long term it's the right approach to do it. But you have to change your mindset. And that's, I think, is if we change this mindset in the investor community, then only then we have achieved what Kofi Annan has asked us to do. So there's a long way to go for us. We have had several milestones, but for me, the very steep path is only at the beginning. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. So much. 34 trillion dollars of assets under management. I believe that number was just 2.6 in 2006 and just 89 signatories. So that's a <laughs> tremendous leap uh, in the next seven years. And because of uh, possibly stakeholder activism and also the listing of companies under the Dow Jones Sustainability Index or the FTSE for good, I think this trend will keep on increasing. Benjamin, uh, I'd like to come to you. What, according to you, are the founding blocks of uh, taking uh, the good to great path in terms of uh, sustainability and uh, responsibility? Sure, maybe I could introduce a bit about what we do as well. I'm here in, in three capacity. Uh, I'm here as uh, a consulting firm that I own and run with my partners, uh, Ideo Asia, and we're a business strategy consulting firm. We also do corporate brokering. I'm also here in my capacity as a family foundation, the Pui Foundation, and we actually help incubate and uh, fund uh, social enterprises. And I'm also here in my personal capacity because uh, I'm an impact investor myself. Uh, but I will say that uh, in our uh, mind, me and my colleagues, there is a difference between CSR and social, uh, social impact investing. Uh, uh, earlier on this morning, somebody said uh, that NGO and social enterprises are the same. Uh, I beg to differ. Uh, NGOs typically, and there are exceptions to the rule, NGOs are typically non-profit organizations that have a social cause 
that typically uh, live in and thrive on grant funding. Social enterprise uh, is also an organization that has a social cause, but a social enterprise needs to have a business model, it needs to have a financial revenue model, and it needs to be financially sustainable along the way. Uh, the problem that we get a lot is when a social enterprise comes to us and says that they are running a business, but they present to us a grant model, and they don't have a business model, they don't have a revenue model, uh, and they're not likely to break even no matter how much money you throw in. And in those cases, they may call themselves a social enterprise, but I say that they are still uh, a charity looking for grant funding, so they might as well just call themselves a charity. Um, I say that because I think for corporate CSR, corporate CSR isn't about social impact investing. That, that's my understanding. Corporate CSR is not a big company that's taking money to invest. Uh, corporate CSR typically is doing something uh, on a donation basis, a grant basis, something that raises awareness, and will work a lot more with NGOs. There are corporate CSRs uh, programs that partner well with social enterprises, and I think for, in our experience, those are social enterprises that are also looking for a handout, they're also looking for a grant. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? I just want to make a distinction there. Um, going from good to great for corporate CSR, one of the things that we do in our corporate uh, consulting company, as well as in our foundation, is we actually mentor and coach organizations to grow in those areas. Uh, when we first got into the game, we realized that CSR in a company is very much like telling CSR about productivity, or telling CSR about uh, hiring retirees or telling a corporate company about um, carbon emissions, right? So you have companies that do lip service to productivity and put productivity as a secondary responsibility under the HR. You also have companies that are all for productivity, 100% behind that, go into Lean Six Sigma, bring in all the programs and build productivity in the whole program, in the whole company. I think same with CSR. There are companies where CSR is a, an appendage to somebody's uh, responsibility. And there are companies for whom CSR is everything and anything that they stand for. And that process of getting good to great uh, requires uh, people in the community to coach them, to tell them what tools are available, to help define what CSR can be, and to run alongside in a, a corporate company. Now, running alongside a corporate company to grow them from good to great uh, will take different forms. If the corporate company is a family business, an SME, then you might get the privilege of, of coaching uh, the owner of the business. But if the company is Credit Suisse or, or uh, uh, Munich Re, and my friend hates Munich Re, uh, then you might be coaching the director of CSR, or hopefully uh, the um, SBO kid that's heading the CSR responsibility. Uh, and the coaching takes various forms. And I think one of the challenges we find in helping a corporate company grow their CSR is to link why CSR to what their business is doing. Um, unfortunately, I don't know if there are corporates out there today, but there are some corporates who tell me flat in the face, Ben, our CSR cannot have anything to do with our business. There's a conflict of interest if our CSR has got anything to do with our business. So if our business is in IT, our CSR will never be in IT. But we also have corporates coming to us telling us, Ben, doing good CSR is doing good business. And I want our CSR programs to drive our good business. So if we are doing IT, we want to do CSR and IT. And the two feed into each other. Now, I won't say which is a right and which is a model, a, a wrong model. But I think those of us who are coaching and helping organizations grow in that area need to understand where and how a corporate that identifies CSR, work within that model, and where we get a chance, move them ahead in the same way that we would coach a company in productivity, in carbon emissions, in employing uh, women, or employing retirees. So good to great doesn't happen just because we say it happens. And with, uh, I used to hit up an SE for uh, an NGO for five years, so I'll say this to colleagues out there who hit the NGOs. Good to great doesn't happen when us on the NGO side keeps complaining about the corporates either. I think we really need to run alongside them and help them grow, show them what it means, coach them, show them the tools, and take them from good to great. Excellent. Thank you. Two very uh, strong points, Benjamin. In, in fact, in terms of uh, corporates uh, working with NGOs and partnering with them and taking across the productivity tools or the Six Sigma tools that they have. Because the challenge that we will face in India now, uh, coming April 2014, is when corporates release uh, $4 billion into the NGO system, 
we do not really know if the NGOs have the appetite or the programs or the bandwidth and skills to run ahead with uh, that kind of funding. So, that is a very valid point you touched. Uh, Somitra, would you like to put your views uh, on the subject? Yeah. Uh, see, primarily, uh, if you look at the uh, tagline of the agenda, good to great. Uh, we are a consulting group where uh, we consult both corporations as well as uh, development agencies who come to us for uh, policy designs and uh, we are specialize only in CSR. So, off late uh, thankfully you know the uh, revolution uh, has assisted us in growing our business to a great extent. Now, uh, the issue primarily that comes now because we have been meeting a lot of corporations and uh, they want our they are online with our services. We thought we will tell them uh, where exactly the money has to be parked and how it has to be implemented. But what happened is when we went on a series of round tables and meetings with them, the realization was something completely ambiguous to what we thought the reaction would be. I, mean, I do not know to take names, but say about majority of them about 65 to 70 percent of the interactions that we have had and they are well established brands who do not have three things in place and I am just saying from my prescription to the problem of good to great is if you get your three things right. With respect to India what we are suffering right now, I mean both of them have given a great international uh, forum, but in an emerging economy like India and the scale of the country where you know your, your diversity changes every 10 kilometers, your cultural food habits everything change. So, understanding social responsibility will differ in every 50 kilometer of stretch and it the goals need to be addressed adequately. One, yes, the uh, social development organizations have to work. I am, uh, before I can start with the prescription, I just have one apprehension. I see a lot of cor corporations actually opening up foundations themselves. And it is not bad to get into the social venture when you are investing money, uh, and it is bound to happen. We are seeing that rise, the top leaders have started, but I think it sets a very wrong precedence where you know you, you tend to enter into a domain where you are going to start. Uh, getting knowledge about the sector very soon whereas people who have been active in the sector for years together for that matter the UN opening up to the private sector initiative is a big boost to the and a statement that you know let the development agencies actually do the work of development you do what you are good at. So, now my prescription for the path from good to great will be based on 